Well, hello, everybody. It is good to see you. And I want to start by welcoming all of our campuses. So for our Kenosha campus and our Racine campus and our online campus, hello to all of you. To our Weekends on Wednesday service who has stopped their life to join us on a Wednesday night, which I don't normally call out the fact that we're here on a Wednesday night, but to join us on a Wednesday night when everybody else is out trick-or-treating, enjoying the devil's holiday, they're here ready to have a good time. Extra loud, extra energetic. Well, a few weeks ago, we uh, launched a teaching series that we're continuing today called The Struggle is Real. We're talking about the difficulties and the challenges and the struggles that all of us have as adults. And what's interesting is if we could get in a time machine, go back to middle school, go back to high school, for the most part, we were idealistic of what our life would look like. For the most part, we have this idea that life is going to look a certain way, our parenting is going to look a certain way, our marriage is going to look a certain way, and then we become adults, and often it doesn't look anything like we imagined. There's often a gap between our adolescence and our adulthood, right? So we move from being very optimistic and idealistic about the world to being pessimistic about the world and uh, having a cynical view. Or we go from having more friends than we know what to do with. It's like everybody's our friend to being in a place in life where we're wondering uh, if we have any friends left. It just feels like we're disconnected. Or we go from admiring and respecting people to being jealous of them. Maybe uh, our thing in life is we go from feeling happy and fulfilled and we're just content to accumulating more and more and more and growing in our feeling of emptiness. And so this series is about all the different struggles we face as adults. Now, 20 years ago, I was uh, working with students. Uh, I was in my early 20s. And so whenever uh, we would get together for a big event, uh, we would always do something unique and a little bit special to make that event memorable. One of the events that we had, maybe once a year, every other year, was called Bigger or Better. Bigger or better. And some of you have played this game before. This is where, like, we give everybody a Q-tip, and then they got to go door to door, right, waking people up. Of course, they usually weren't waking people up, but they're interrupting their lives and saying, hey, I've got a Q-tip. Will you give me something bigger or better for this? And so someone might give them a tube of toothpaste, and they would take that tube of toothpaste, and they would go to the next home and say, I need something bigger or better. And people, for the most part, were cooperative with the game. And I think, like, one time, uh, the biggest thing that I personally remember is when somebody gave us a couch and so in our youth center we have a couch that started out with like a cotton ball or a q-tip or something ridiculous well there was a teenager in california a few years ago named steven ortiz and he played this game he started with a cell phone traded it up to another cell phone that eventually led to an ipod touch he took the ipod touch traded it for a dirt bike and then another dirt bike and then eventually got back into the electronics got a macbook pro He took the MacBook Pro and he traded it for a 20-year-old Toyota 4Runner, okay? So this is is what he traded up for, except for he was 15 years old at the time, so he couldn't even drive it. And so he took this, he traded it for a souped-up, hot rod type of golf cart. And then he took that golf cart, went back to bikes, dirt bikes, street bikes, eventually got back into cars, cars, and he got a 1975 Ford Bronco. Okay, this is a big deal. Because this was like some sort of uh, collector's item worth about $15,000. But driving around in a Bronco wasn't as cool as a roadster to him. And so through a number of other trades, true story, he ended up with a Porsche. Yeah. In less than two years, he went from literally nothing, right, just this little cell phone that he traded, to a Porsche. Two years of relentlessly pursuing bigger and better and more. Now, if we're honest, for most of us, that's the story of our life. We're constantly trading our time and our energy and our opportunities for bigger and for better and for more. And so most of us have become black belts in getting stuff done. And the results, if we're honest, is that we are often mentally tired, we're emotionally drained, we're physically exhausted, and we are just burned out. And so I want to talk today about this epidemic of burnout. Some of the words I hear most often around here at Great Lakes Church are, I'm overwhelmed, 
I'm overscheduled, and I'm exhausted. Okay, so I hear those words from people who are young, and I hear those words from people who are more mature in life, right? I hear those words from people who have lots of resources and for those with very, very few resources. I hear those words from people who are professionals in, in what they do all day long, and then I hear them from people who are stay-at-home parents or from those who are retired, from men and from women, from Republicans and Democrats, for those with lots of kids and those with no kids. It just seems like everybody is running on fumes. And so in many ways, it's, it's like our life is a balloon, all right? And so a balloon, as you know, has a certain amount of capacity. And so if I spent the next couple moments just keep blowing up this balloon, eventually it's going to scare us, right? Eventually it's going to pop, and, and I'm not going to do that. But I, I want to say, oh, it's got helium in it. No. Uh, uh, here, here's the deal. This balloon has a certain amount of capacity in it. And if we, if we blew it up too much, it's, it's going to explode. Well, what happens in our life isn't that we explode, right? It's not that we burst. What happens in our life is that we burn out. Burnout is when the demands placed on you exceed the resources within you. It's when the demands placed on you exceed the resources within you. Now, this balloon is going to bother me if I don't get rid of it, so I will put it aside for a few moments. Now, when burnout happens, it affects us in all sorts of ways. Uh, one of the ways that it, uh, it, it affects us, one of the signs of burnout, is exhaustion. Okay? If you're regularly feeling physically tired, emotionally tired, relationally tired, mentally tired, if your energy is always depleted, well, that's a pretty good sign of burnout. And some of the greatest men and greatest women who've ever walked this planet have burned out because of exhaustion. In fact, in our Bible, there is a story of a guy by the name of Job. It's really kind of the biography of Job. And in, in this biography, we learn that Job was a very godly man. He loved God with all of his heart. He, he, he would take his, his, uh, what he knew about God, and he would be as, as dedicated, as faithful to God as he could possibly be. He, he spent his energy and his resources trying to honor God. And... Unfortunately for Job, he went through a very, very difficult season. He went through a season of loss where he started losing his resources and his health and some family members. And, and Job's response to this loss was this. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. Wow. Wow. Right? What, what an amazing attitude. The Lord is the one who's given me these things, taken away. I hold them very, very loosely. Now, I've said this before, but I want to say it again. I think most of us are prepared for days of disappointment, maybe even weeks of disappointment, but we are not prepared for years of disappointment. And Job's season of disappointment didn't go away after a couple of days or after a couple of weeks. Those weeks turned into months, and it started to it, it started to wear on him. It started to uh, chisel away at his attitude. And eventually he gets to the point where he cannot take it anymore. And this attitude of what the Lord just gives and he takes away, blessed be his name, it turns to this. I'd rather die than suffer like this. I hate my life and I don't want to go on living. He says, I'm done. And if you've ever experienced complete exhaustion, you can relate to Job. He says, I can't do it anymore. That is a sign of burnout. Another sign of burnout is lack of motivation. So if you've lost an inner drive or an energy and a passion that you used to have, and you kind of go through life and you feel emotionally numb, you don't feel the highs, you don't feel the lows, that's a sign of burnout. Another sign of burnout is everybody drains you. If you've ever gotten to the point where you can't stand seeing another person. You just don't like people anymore. You're critical of others all the time. You just feel like anybody who's around me, they want something from me. They just take, 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 take. Nobody's ever grateful. If you've ever gotten to that point, that is burnout. One of the most loved people in all of Jewish history is a guy by the name of Moses. And the reason he's so loved is because early on in their history, the Jews were slaves in Egypt. For 400 years, they were slaves. Moses is the guy who led them out of Egypt. 
Moses is the guy who had a very critical role in leading them to freedom. And after just a couple of months of freedom, Moses is starting to get fed up with the people because he's having to deal with personality conflicts. He's having to deal with the tension of people living together day after day after day in a new environment. He's having to solve people's problems. He's having to keep people hopeful and motivated. And eventually, it it catches up to him, and he just burns out. The people burn him out, and he says, God, I can't carry all these people by myself. The load is far too heavy. If this is how you intend to treat me, just go ahead and kill me. Do me a favor and spare me this misery. Don't you love that? Like, here's this guy who's loved by everybody. He just says, God, I can't take it anymore. These people are driving me nuts. When you find yourself angry on a regular basis at the very people you love and respect the most, that's a sign of burnout. Another sign of burnout is it's hard to focus. It's hard to stay mentally engaged. Your body is present, but your mind is somewhere else. When you're burned out, what happens is your heart starts to mess with your head and you lose the ability to think straight. Now, in 2016 and 2017, I burned out. Okay, I've talked about that before. I'm not going to get into all the details and all the transitions of why that burnout occurred, but I was burned out. And in that season, I look back and it's almost ridiculous the way that I thought. It was the most unfocused I've ever been in my life. I missed meeting after meeting, things that were on my calendar, I just for whatever reason. The only time in my life that I can look back to and say I regularly miss paying bills. Twice, my, my mortgage company called me and says, you missed your mortgage payment. My wife got into a little fender bender and through the midst of that, found out that the car I was driving, thankfully hers was insured, I hadn't paid my insurance. I was driving without insurance for over a month. Uh, I had missed... Um, D- different payments and, and different bills that were just like, right. I'm like, what has happened? I literally thought something was, what was wrong mentally with me. And, and I, I went to a doctor and says, I need to get this looked at. And at the end, he says, Dave, stress can do a lot of different things to you. Um, but in that season, it's very hard for me to stay engaged mentally. That is a sign of burnout. Another sign of burnout is we become very, very emotional. Like irrational emotional. Disproportionately emotional. Okay, so if you ever find yourself on edge all the time, and you're always exaggerating the problem, and, and you're thinking in extremes all the time, that's, that's a sign of burnout. Everything is always all good or all bad. Everybody hates me. Nobody does this. Everybody does this. When something bad occurs in your life, and your whole attitude is, yep, this is just my life. Everything just happens to me. Of course it's, it's me. It's the story of my life. Man, that's burnout when you're irritable all the time, right? You, you start to look at your, your spouse's gum chewing as more than just annoying. You're like seeing it as a personal character flaw that they need to deal with. That is a sign of burnout. King David, the second king of Israel, he is known for his love for God. In fact, he wrote many, many different poems and songs that became a part of our Bible. Uh, most of them are found in the book of Psalms. King David regularly talked about the faithfulness of God. He regularly talked about how God is watching out for him. How no matter where he goes, he can't escape the presence of God. God is always there. But then David goes through a season, a long season, of difficulty and challenges. His boss has it out for him. And he burns out. And this is what he says in that season. He writes it out. Oh, Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you look the other way? This guy who always talked about the faithfulness of God is now saying, God, you don't even notice me. How long is this going to continue? He was disproportionately emotional. That's a sign of burnout. Another sign of burnout is this. We're not productive anymore. We're busy we, we work and we work and we work and we work and we work, but it just feels like nothing of significance is getting done. We're not accomplishing anything. That's a sign of burnout. Another sign of burnout is lack of personal care. I'm not taking care of myself physically. I'm not taking care of myself emotionally. I'm not taking care of myself spiritually. 
It's, it's, it's very difficult for me to connect with God. I'm not taking care of myself socially and in my relationships. That's a sign of burnout. Another sign of burnout is fear. Now, to be clear, fear is a part of the landscape of life. It's never going away. You and I will always have fear in our life. But when we're burned out, fear is not something we're able to confront anymore. It just overpowers us. So instead of walking into our fears and being courageous in the fears that we experience, what happens is fear conquers us. Vince Lombardi has a quote. He says this. He says, fatigue makes cowards of us all. And that's true. People of faith, people of courage, start to let fear dominate their life and impact their decisions. Now, in the Bible, we come across many, 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 many men and women who confronted their fears, who walked into their fears, people of faith. And we could literally just spend the next hour listing all of these names of individuals. But right at the top of the list of people of faith, people of courage, people who trusted God would be a guy by the name of Elijah. Elijah was a prophet. Okay, that doesn't mean he had some crystal ball and would tell the future. A prophet, their job was in some ways to do what I do. They would speak messages of hope or messages of warning depending on the situation and what was taking place. But they would speak very clear messages to the Jewish people. And so Elijah was very respected by the Jewish people. And when he would speak a message specifically of encouragement, it would boost their faith. Well, Elijah was able to do that because he saw firsthand many of the miracles of God. He saw many things that were supernatural. Like you and I, if we had our opportunity to experience and see what Elijah saw, we'd be like, I'm never going to have a doubt about God again. I'm never going to doubt his faithfulness. I'm never going to doubt his grace. I'm never going to doubt his existence because I have seen it all. And yet, after one extreme miracle that Elijah was able to see with his own eyes, somebody puts a hit on his life. The queen. Not, not, uh, Elijah was not the king, okay? So the queen, uh, who, who married to the king of Israel, puts a hit on Elijah's life. And... When that happens, he's terrified. And instead of saying, I, I know the power of God and I know how God protects and I know how God watches over me, he runs out in the wilderness and he becomes a fugitive. And it's in that time of running and fear that he says this to God. He says, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who are already died or dead. I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. Like, just take me. I can't do this anymore. And I love it because we would look at this person of faith and we would assume he's out in the desert singing, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Right? He, he's not doing that. He's not running out and getting some bumper sticker to put on his chariot. Too blessed to be depressed. No, he's exhausted. He's disillusioned. And it's the reason why we can gather together week after week after week and we can talk about the greatness of God and the faithfulness of God and we can sing songs and we can celebrate baptisms and we can do it week after week after week. And then when we have one bad day, it's like, where are you, God? Do you even know I'm here? And then that day goes into two days and three days and we just wonder, God, where are you? Burnout is when the demands placed on you exceed the resources within you. There's an old children's song that many of you may remember. It's called, There's a Hole in My Bucket. Dear Liza, dear Liza, there's a hole in my bucket. Dear Liza, dear Liza, a hole. And then she, his wife, uh, Henry's wife, Liza, decides to confront the issue of the hole by saying what? Well, fix it, dear Henry, dear Henry, dear Henry. And it's just this really exhaustive, long song. He says, what shall I fix it with? But it's got a whole chorus that goes with, what shall I fix it? Here, Liza, dear. Okay, and, and she says, with straw, like make a cork or something. And he says, well, the straw is too long. And she says, well, cut it, dear Henry, dear Henry, dear Henry. And he says, with what shall I cut it? With a knife, dear Henry, dear Henry, dear Henry. Well, the knife is too dull. Well, sharpen it. Well, I will sharpen it. But what shall I sharpen it with? What shall I sharpen it? With a stone, with a sharpening stone. But the stone is too dry. Well, wet it, dear Henry. With what shall I wet it? With water. Well, what shall I carry the water? With a bucket. 
there's a hole in my bucket. It just goes full well for it. It's just the most ridiculous song in the world, right? Every single one of us have a hole in our life. Every single one of us have things that drain us. We can't escape the reality that there are things that drain us. But if there are more things that are draining us than filling us up, we are in trouble. That is something that has to be addressed. Otherwise, it leads to burnout. So let me just kind of uh, become an artist. This is kind of, I'm going to be Monet here for a few moments. And I'm going to draw for you, all right? And I know this may be a little bit difficult to see on the camera, but, but I'm going to do my best. Here's what happens, all right? So let me just draw the bucket of life. Here we go, the bucket of life. We will auction this off after our gathering today, all right? So this is, this is our life. Every one of us need things that fill us because inevitably there are going to be things that drain us, okay? And if we're operating right here, let's say the bucket of our life is full, this is when we can hang out with people and when we can... Uh, we can go to work and give it our best. We can be with our family. We can give them our best. We can be with our, our, our kids, our, our partner, right? We can, we can do all that. We can just give our energy and we can have creative ideas and it's fun, you know, it's, it's fun to do life. But what happens is that water level starts to drop. This is when anxiety sets in. This is when we start to feel overwhelmed. This is when we start to feel stressed. This is when we start to feel like I can't get everything done. If, if we last in that period for a long time, it starts to affect us. But if it gets down even lower, what happens is we start to have an emotional breakdown. This is when life starts to fall apart. We start to think irrationally. We, we can't connect the dots. We're missing meetings. We're missing bills. We're saying, man, I'm trying to hold my life together. I just don't know. And, and we're just consumed with, with fear all the time and and. And it's a very, very dangerous place to have an emotional or mental breakdown. But if that thing continues to drop, right, if, if we don't address it, eventually what happens is we have a nervous breakdown. And, and this is when it's like our entire life has fallen apart because we feel utterly hopeless. It's like we can't even get out of bed. We can't function day to day. And so the issue we have to address is, what is it that drains me? And you ought to know this. I ought to know this, right? Negativity drains me. I, one of the disciplines, and, and, and I've talked a lot about my faults and my failures. One of the great disciplines I put in my life is I just refuse to hang out with negative people. And when I get around people who are positive, I usually am proactive. I want you in a group that I'm in. I, I want you, uh, to, you know, to, to do breakfast with you. I want to do lunch with you. I like to be around positive people because I know I need that in my life. Because I just, like everybody else, I gravitate toward negativity if I'm around it too long and I don't want that. Too many meetings drain me. Emails drain me. I've talked about this before. Unresolved Problems in a relationship drain me, whether that's with my wife, with my kids, or, or with, with any of you. That drains me. I, I feel like I want a, a bow tied on every relationship. I just, I, I just want um, to be stress-free in that. Uh, an overbooked schedule. One of the areas that I used to be totally out of control with was my schedule. I just said yes to everything, and I had to start taking control of it. And it was in the last two years why I learned to do that because of how uh, unhealthy I was operating. Um, unexpected expenses, right? When, when things come my way and it's like too many of them, that starts to drain me because it, it builds up fear and anxiety. And uh, I was in San Diego uh, two weeks ago, or uh, two or three weeks ago now, and I um, was speaking at a church I used to be on staff at. And um, when I was there, I skipped two tolls. They have a toll road, and I skipped them, because I know, you know, whatever, get a $5 fine added to it, and I was, I was in a hurry. I didn't want to stop, be honest with you. I was like, yeah, I'll deal with it later. Um, and so I was willing to deal with the fine. Well, uh, they sent me a fine in the mail. Um, I didn't realize the fine was more than $5. Uh, my car rental company charged me $15. I was like, ah, that's about what I thought. And then the actual toll road sent me this, $85 for two tolls. Two tolls. This caused me stress for like two days. I couldn't think of anything else. Like, I, what, what in the world, man? That causes me uh, stress. Uh, clutter in my life drains me. So I try to keep clutter out of my life. So, burnout is when the demands placed on you 
exceed the resources within you. Burnout is when the demands placed on you exceed the resources within you. So if you want to avoid burnout or, or recover from burnout, you've got to find a way to build some resources inside. And if you're too busy to do that, if you're too busy to find ways to fill your bucket, I'm telling you, it will lead to burnout, and it will affect you in your relationships. It will affect you in your thinking. It will affect you um, in, in every area. But, man, it will really affect you in how you connect with God and how feel, close you feel to God. And so my challenge to you is this. Live in a way today that will help you thrive tomorrow. Live in a way today that will help you thrive tomorrow. Make decisions today that will help you tomorrow. So let's just spend the next few minutes talking about what that looks like. Number one, this is not rocket science here. I've got to learn to do what fuels me. This is going to look different for all of us. Right? We all have different schedules. We all have different freedom in our schedules. We, we, some have kids who are in sports. Others have uh, high demands in their, uh, and stress in their jobs. But all of us have different schedules. What is it that fuels you? So for me, hanging out with my kids fuels me. I know that sounds like, oh, the, the right thing to say. It does. I don't know the last time I've ever said no to my kids when they say, hey, Dad, let's go out to breakfast, even though that means I'm paying right? Let's go out to lunch. Let's go. And sometimes I might have to say, I can't do it today. Let's do it tomorrow. And often they have to tell me because I'm busy and I'm doing things, right? They have to come to me and approach me. But I love that. I love date nights. I, I love hanging out with friends. If it was up to me, I'd hang out with friends seven nights a week. I, I just love that. I love hunting. I love watching shows on hunting. That fuels me, all right? Hiking, kayaking, reading. And here's the deal. I know it's easy sometimes to feel guilty to say, man, I, I get there's so many people who need me, my kids, my spouse. My, and, and so, I just kind of feel selfish when I spend time with myself. That's a legit fear. But I'm telling you, if you do not fill yourself and you're always having these drains on your life, it's going to catch up. And you will burn out. You will have nothing to give to others. So it is primary. It's first. You've got to take care of yourself. Number two, you want to avoid burnout or climb out of burnout? You have to understand balance in life. Understand balance in life, okay? Now, let me tell you the tension that all of us live with. The tension is we've got so many things that we've got to give our time to, so what happens? We're like, I've got to get perfectly balanced here. I've got uh, my, my, my family, uh, you know, my, my partner, um, I, my, my job needs me. Oh, I, Dave said I need time for myself, so I need that. Um, I, I also, I've got some ideas over here, so I've got to perfectly, okay, okay, nobody move. Nobody move now. We got it, right? Guys, that's not how life works. Right? Life's not like that. Life is organic. It's moving. It's changing all the time. And so what we really need to do is think of, of, of our life as, as, and our, the balance whole th paradigm. We have to think really more in the line of a fulcrum, the pivot point on which everything balances. Because there are going to be times in life where God does seem to be putting some pressure. And this is where we need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And through times maybe of prayer, or maybe it's in times of worship where we're singing and expressing our love to God that God just, through his Holy Spirit, convicts us and maybe puts a little bit of pressure on our family and says, your family needs you right now. And, and we move the pivot point to our family. Or, or maybe the pressure point that God's putting on you is, hey, in this season, your kids need you more. They haven't been seeing you as much. And you start to move your heart in that direction. Or maybe the, the, the pressure he's putting is, hey, in this season, you do need to put more time and effort at work. I've blessed you with this job, yeah, and, and this is a season where, where your employer needs you. And so you just, you move your heart in that direction. But it really is the fulcrum and where our heart needs to be in certain seasons. But that means we need to be attuned to God. It's hard to be attuned to the Spirit of God when we're burned out and we're exhausted. When I'm depleted, when I'm just, my, my energy is gone. It's hard for me to be sensitive to what God wants to do. When I'm not rested, here's what I find. That I will often put my time and my attention and my energy in the wrong places. So God will say, hey, Dave, this is where it needs to be, but I'll be over here. This is why rest is so important. You want to you wanna be energized? you want to make sure your bucket is filled, then you need to plan rest into your schedule. That's what Jesus did. And the thing about Jesus is everybody needed his time. 
They needed his attention. They needed him to give them a little bit of focus. They needed him to teach them, him to give them advice, him to give them wisdom. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And the more people needed him, the more intentional he was to get rest. In fact, we read this. But Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. People do not mess up their lives because they're evil. It's because they're frail. People mess up their lives because they're not thinking clearly. Because there's so much pressure going on. We don't forget that we're teachers or we're business owners or we're police officers or we're lawyers or we're moms or dads or husbands or wives, boyfriends or girlfriends. We don't forget that. What we forget is that we're human. Several weeks ago, I went out with a good buddy of mine, and uh, he's a pastor of a large church, and I just opened up to him about this season of burnout that I'd gone through for two years. And, and I just talked about how crushing it was, how eye-opening it was. Like, I didn't realize how affected a, a human being can be. And as I opened up, he then opened up, and he talked about a two-year period of burnout that he went through, and... Uh, I said to him, I said, how did you manage leading the large church that you're leading when you were doing that? He said, be honest with you, Dave, I didn't even care. He said, I just stopped caring. And then lunch was over and, and it was done. I didn't think much about it until three weeks later, I get a text from a mutual friend who says, hey, did you hear our buddies had to step down and resign from his church? Because in that season of burnout, he made some moral decisions that didn't line up with his faith. And it devastated me. I couldn't sleep that night. True story, I couldn't sleep. I kept thinking, but for the grace of God. I didn't cross moral lines. I didn't cross ethical lines. But I, I, I couldn't sleep, and I kept wrestling with this thought that this buddy of mine is actually a really, really great guy. He loves God. He loves people. He wants to be a great husband. He wanted to be a great dad. I know that. He wanted to be a great pastor. He wanted to be a great friend. I know that. I know that. I know I know him well enough to, to, to say with conviction. That's exactly what he wanted. But he just got tired. And the hole in the bucket of his life became bigger and bigger and bigger. And there was more going out than was coming in. And so earlier I mentioned Elijah, this man of faith, is on the run. He's a fugitive. He's fearing for his life. And he's saying, God, I just want to die. Well, then he falls asleep and he takes a nap. Here's what we read. Then Elijah laid down and slept under the broom tree. Later he got up and ate and drank. And the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights. Now, I love this because a guy falls asleep. He's like, he takes a nap, he gets up and he has a donut. And he's like, I'm ready to go again. <laughs> Sometimes all we need is Serious rest, but not just an occasional rest, a rest that is built into the rhythm of our life. Two more thoughts here for you. If we're going to fill the bucket of our life, we need to find a lightning rod. Now, I say this because in life, you're going to be, at times, filled with electrical charges from work, from marriage, from parenting, from frustrations you have. And when you're walking around with electrical charge, you're just going to let that fly in anybody. You're just going to be ready to strike at any moment. Well, for those of you who don't know, a lightning rod is this long rod that can be put up on the top of buildings, and it's grounded, which is very important. Because if an electrical charge from a lightning bolt hits it, it takes the charge and it grounds it. Okay, so it doesn't fry electronic, uh, electronics, it doesn't fry your computers, it doesn't fry a bunch of wires. The lightning rod grounds the electrical charge. Well, in our life, we all need lightning rods. We need people that we can talk to and be straight with. Now, in my life, I really have two lightning rods. I have a therapist that on different seasons, I will see them, right? I'm in a very healthy place now, but when I wasn't out there, I'd see them regularly. And I would just unload, and I knew legally they couldn't say anything about it. <laughs> right? Sometimes I'd let words fly, and they didn't get judgmental. And they would, you know, ask, well, it sounds like you're really, really um, intense about this, Dave. You know? But they were very, very kind. They helped me. But I also have a couple close, close friends that I get together with on a regular basis who I can just unpack some of my thoughts and sometimes go a little bit too negative and, and they're there to help ground me. By the way, just for a side note, my wife is not one of my lightning rods because 
I don't need her to know every relationship tension or every negative thing. Usually when I have to unload is when I hear too much negativity. Right, somebody puts an anonymous thing on a connection card, which thankfully that doesn't get to me anymore. But, you know, Dave, well, let's change this, let's change that. And it's just like sometimes it's just overwhelming to me. And um, I, I don't tell my wife because, you know, if you've ever met my wife, she's super, super sweet. But I promise you she loves me and wants to be protective of me. So she'll see, you know, someone in line. <laughs> she'll want to come out of her skin. Now, she won't do that, but <laughs> I want to say something, right? So I, I try to, uh, to protect her from that. And then finally, and I hesitated even saying this because it, it just seems like the church thing to say, but stay connected to Jesus. Now, the reason I hesitate to say that is because when we think about our life, everything is spiritual. And I don't want it to be like, well, here's my spiritual life. No, everything in our life is spiritual. The way I parent is spiritual. The, the way I, I, I manage resources is spiritual. The way I um, treat my spouse, you know, that's, that's spiritual. Like, everything is spiritual. But it is so important for me to stay connected to Jesus because if I'm sensitive to Jesus, then I can get a sense of, hey, I, I need to go and apologize to my wife for this. I need to humble myself in front of this church member and, and, and apologize for, for being a little bit too intense in my interaction. And that doesn't happen, obviously, often. But whatever it is, that I can be sensitive to God. Because when I'm sensitive to God, guess what? I stay fired up. The Apostle Paul in the first century, man, he had some tough, tough things happen to him. And yet he goes, we're pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. He says, I'm able to endure because of what's happening in my spirit. And so we need to stay connected to Jesus. All of us do that in different ways. For some, that's going to happen more so through prayer. For others, through music. For some, it's going to be getting out into nature. For others, it's just time of reflection. For others, it may be by serving somebody because that's when you just feel alive spiritually. Maybe for others, it's through reading and through studying. Every one of us connects with God differently, but it's important that we do that so that we stay filled up. And we can have all the excuses in the world. Well, Dave, my schedule, my boss says this, and if you had my life, listen, at the end of the day, I am in charge of me. You're not in charge of me, I'm in charge of me. You are in charge of you. At some point, you have to own that. Last week, I shared about my dishwasher that had broken. It turned into a nightmare of a product, project. It was raining in my basement. It, just, it was a horrible, horrible situation. A one-hour event turned into six hours, okay? Crazy. Towards the end of that, my son Jaden sees me on edge, and he's 12 years old, and he kneels down next to me while I'm trying to put this thing back together, and he says, Dad, I want to remind you, you're in charge of your attitude. He said, seriously, he says this. He says, Dad, you can't help what happens to you, but you can help how you respond to it, and so don't say the dishwasher's making you mad. Don't say, you have to own this. That's it, 12 years old. So I said, get out of here, okay? I say, I don't want to hear this right now. Two or three days later, I hear him playing a video game, and he is screaming mad at the TV. Something's happened. I just open the door. I say, hey, Jaden, that video game is not making you mad. You are in charge of you. I'm putting it right back on him, man. Listen, guys, we can do it. And if you say, well, I'm burned out, just know this. Just because it's your past doesn't mean it's your future. You got to find ways to stay energized. You got to find ways to stay filled. You can't control all the different things that, that, that cause leaks in your life. You can't, you can't stop every drain. You can, you can maybe bring a few of them to, to be less of a drain, but man, that's just part of life. Make sure you're staying energized so you can serve God faithfully with your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for giving us life. I pray that you would help each of us to identify clearly the things that fill us and the things that drain us. And then give us the wisdom how to navigate our life in such a way that we can spend more time doing the things that fill us and less time doing the things that drain us so that we can, with intensity, live our life to the fullest. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.